that. So I'll be talking about Xdebug. Uh, Xdebug is a tool that I have been writing for ages and ages now, and I've spoken about it before, as you might have seen or heard of. So I'm quite wondering how many people here are actually using Xdebug. Maybe I should have asked it the other way around. How many of you are not using it yet? And how many of you are asleep? <laughs> All right, so um, I'll be still talking about XD, but what I try to do, I'm trying to re renew my talk and show a little bit the more advanced things only. I'm not going to show you uh, uh, how to count the number of functions you have run and things like that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I, I'm slightly blinded by the light in the back, but uh, wave and, a, and I should be able to find you. If you want to leave feedback of the talk, you can do that at the joint in URL. I, I really would like uh, feedback. I know the wireless isn't so happy about it, but uh, go for it and try. And let's start it. So I'm Dutch. I've been living in London for about two years now. It's quite a long time. I did not realize that. I've been doing PHP development, using it for about 10 years now, uh, contributing to PHP for about eight. And I've written Many, many different extensions, some useful, uh, some not so useful, like um, the Debus extension, but it's fun. I've also written Xdebug, so I probably should be the person uh, that, that should know most things about it. Um, there's one feature in Xdebug that I have never used. Um, it's actually quite cool, so uh, hopefully the next version of my talk will have that in there too. And I am uh, at the moment a freelancer doing PHP work, development work, and also PHP internals work. So find that interesting, come up, at me, come up to me and talk to me about that. Okay, so back to Xdebug. Xdebug is there for three main things. It's a development aid for live debugging and for profiling. So uh, who has used Xdebug for profiling here? Okay, just a few. Uh, what about live debugging with IDs? Uh, also a few. And who has used it in any other form? Mm, I don't know. Those hands don't add up together. Uh, anyway, so first thing is Xdebug, what it does, if you just install it, it pimps up your right. It doesn't create a nice car with enormous large rims or something like that, but that's ba basically the, f the main thing that you see when happens if you install Xdebug. You get nice error messages, right? So this is beyond the past, uh, age and age ago. Your PHP error message would show up like this if you wouldn't be using Xdebug. Now, in recent versions of PHP in 5.3, for some odd reason, uh, HTML errors is turned off by default, which means that all the errors show up like this again, which is really annoying. Uh, why does this turn off by default? I don't know. I'll see if I can fix that back. But if you want to have Xdebug to show nice error messages, you have to turn on HTML errors, which is a PHP INI setting. And then they should look like this. It's a nice orange box that has nothing to do with me being Dutch. Um, but it does show quite a bit of information here. Um, one of the things is uh, you have the time and the memory columns. They are time since the start of the script and the amount of memory in use, the name of the function, the parameters, and the location. And all of those things are, um, can configure quite a bit in those error messages because um, you don't want to show too much information because if you have a error message that runs in like a tight loop with like a 10,000 iterations, you will get, get 10,000 HTML tables. Browsers don't handle that very well, or actually not at all, and especially if they're very large. So lots of the information in here is not there by default, but you have to turn it on. So there's a few settings. That's collect, collect include, which has a value of zero or one, meaning uh, whether you it should show include files. This is on by default, it's really quite useful. Then there's a few other ones. Um, those are not so much used with stack traces, only if you show local variables in there, for example. Those values can be used in both stack traces, function traces, which I will get to in a bit, as well as Xdebix Vardom. And they will limit the amount of information that's being shown by Vardoms. Again, I'll have an example of that. And then there is something called file link format. Now, if you have a slightly clever IDE or, well, editor or something, or if you use Firefox, you can set up in Firefox protocol handlers specifically for, um, um, for so that you, you can set up a protocol handler in such a way that 
it can, Firefox can call script for you to do that. So what I've done, I've written a small script that parses the, the thing pa passed into it. Uh, it, has, it reads gvim for vim in GNOME and then with the file line number. So what will happen is if I now get an error message in one of my uh, scripts, I can click on the link and it will open it in vim, in gvim, which is really quite useful. And I know that on the Mac, TextMate has this built in. So you can use TX, txmt, colon slash slash open, and it, yeah, it's a little bit more difficult, but it works quite well. Makes it very easy that you, if you have an error message, it can open it in your ID. And most of the other IDs also have a file link format that works for them, but I haven't actually quite checked which they are. But I, th I know at least Eclipse has it as well. Okay, now some people don't quite like the orange, and uh, the error messages can be quite styled with CSS because there's CSS class attached to it. So in this case, I'd like to make it pink, and uh, the uh, little exclamation mark is blinking, which you can do with CSS. Now, whether every browser supports blinking, I don't know, but uh, you can. However, this screenshot, be, bes besides being pink, uh, it also shows a few other things. It shows a, a dump of every server uh, variable. Actually, it only does it for request UI in this case, because those are also things you can configure. You can tell XDBook, if I get an error message, show me the contents of superglobals. And the setting for that is xdbook.dump. And then the name of your super global, which can be quite useful. However, it will only do that the first time that an error message pops up, pops up because um, the super global should never change. I know some people do hacks and tricks to change the super globals, to change them because to sanitize variables or things like that. I think that's a bad thing to do. In case you do want to see the super globals at every uh, every error message, you can do that, but it's off by default. And also something that's really quite useful is in um, the bottom block is the variables in the local scope. So what you can tell Xebix to say, if I have an error message, also show me the variables that show up in the last PHP function that's being called. It cannot do that for internal functions like strlen or fallget contents or things like that, but it will do that for PHP functions. And you can see which variables I've defined in here. Uh, there's A and there's I. Uh, this little script I was doing, I was looping something and set a, a timeout of a second. Now, you mentioned that I can just click on those links and it should open. Of course, I had not tested that. Uh, see, I've gotten a new laptop, so I haven't set that up yet. But if you go into Firefox in the settings, uh, it's, I've written this down in the documentation of XEbook, so that's probably the best way of looking at it. Look at the file link thing. Anyway. A few other things that not quite known so well, mostly because I sort of forgot to document them, I found out yesterday, uh, is sometimes when you have like a, a, a CMS or anything like that, and if your error messages show up in the middle, they might get hidden, they might be behind other things. Uh, these CSS might be skewed, it might basically mess up your layout so much to make it very annoying. So, but those functions, if you call XDBook start error collection, well, from that point on, it will still remember all the error messages that show up, but it doesn't show them instantly. It will just store them in a buffer somewhere. Then if you call get collected errors, it will return all the error messages that it has found up, up till then in a nicely formatted orange the, um, layout stuff. And that you can probably, for example, use to put them under, under the normal content and yeah, make sure you can format it nicely and it doesn't break your layout which is not documented yet, but will probably soon be, because now I know it's there. Uh, another thing, variables. If you do Vardamp, I use Vardamp quite a lot still. Um, in some simple cases, it's all just the best way of doing it or the simplest way of doing it. But reading this output is very difficult. In order to read this properly, what you actually have to do is you have to do a few source. And then you get some HTML stuff that is, right, and here you have the, uh, the Vardom, right, is quite, not, quite nice, but uh, still quite difficult to read. Now, what XDBook does, if you install it, you get something like this instead. Uh, it's nicely formatted. You don't have to do pre-tags. You have colors and things like that. And here's the settings back that I showed you before. There's var display max data, var display max, max depth, and max children. Those names are really long, and I might change that because they annoy the hell out of me. Um, but anyway, what they do, 
max data configures how how much of a string it will show you in a var dump. Um, so it will show you only the first 25 characters and then three dots at the end. It will also show you the full length of it. Um, so in case you have loaded like a big file into memory, it doesn't dump it all out and screen it like probably good characters and well, it's not useful to see all that stuff. Uh, max depth is the number of nesting levels in arrays and objects. So if I would have one more, so this is the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, and if this one would be an array, an object, then it would show there's just something more, but it wouldn't actually show you. It would have been really cool if you could click on it and it would open it up, but I haven't figured out how to do that yet in an ISA, maybe some other time. And Max Children tells you how much uh, uh, array elements it should show in case you have ginormous arrays. Now, some people don't like Xdebug overriding Vardam, so you can turn it off now. Uh, it's a feature that's requested quite a bit. Mm. So you can use overload underscore var underscore dump equals zero. That doesn't mean that, that means that xdebug does not overload var dump, but there's still xdebug underscore var underscore dump, so you can still use this format. I know it's on the bottom of the slide and it goes far down, so. I tried modifying my slides to have everything slightly further up, but uh, couldn't manage with this one. Okay, now something <coughs> that will be new in the upcoming version of xdebug, version 2.2, is that you also will have the same kind of formatting and var display max data settings for the command line as well. At the moment, you still have to turn on C like underscore color equals one. Um, I was really in between calling that color or color with a U. Um, then decided that most of PHP is in American English, so it is without you. Uh, but yeah, it irks me. Uh, <laughs> the sign is turning into a Brit here. Uh, Okay, anyway, it shows you, it uses the same colors if it can as the web interface. So it uses integers are green and strings are red and it formats it nicely. And most useful is that the var, this, the, the, the max tab, max children and max uh, data settings also work now on the command line. You t turn it on with CLI color. Sadly, that doesn't work on Windows because we haven't figured out a portable way of doing that. It works if you have something called ANSI sysloaded. So it brings up memory. That's for me. But, uh, I know there's APIs for it, but we haven't figured that out quite yet. This has been a contribution by, uh, by, by Michael McLean. And it also works in the error messages. So it now shows up in red, which works better if you have a black ground and not a white background. All right. Another few things, Scream. Um, this actually used to be a separate extension called Scream. What it will do is if you turn this on, um, Xdeva will make sure that every error will actually be shown, even the ones that have been uh, prefixed by an at sign. Now, at sign is in PHP, uh, has an interesting name in turn, it's called a strudel. That has nothing to do with food. Uh, it's the Hebrew name for an at sign. Um, but what it does, it actually turns off all error reporting by setting error reporting to zero which is okay if you know exactly why you want to do this, but in many cases, if you see software written by somebody else, you don't know where those at signs are, and sometimes your script just stops, and you have no idea why. I've had this happen once. I had no idea why it stopped, and looked and looked, and finally found out after about two and a half hours of, of looking at it, it was done in front of a MySQL connect line, and I knew MySQL was running, I was wondering about why this wasn't working, then I removed the ad sign and found out that the MySQL extension wasn't loaded. Which would be very simple to see if the ad sign wasn't there, and then it would have not cost me two and a half hours. So, Scream, uh, I'm considering turning it on by default, but that probably annoys too many people, so I will see about that. <laughs> uh, and this is, by the way, uh, the painting, the screen by Edward Munk, or one of the four. Some other things, um, this is mainly useful for running unit tests and things like this. Uh, in our unit test that we had done for Zeta components is um, we wanted to test where the headers are properly set as well. And although PHP has a function uh, headers get all or something like that, I don't exactly rem remember the name of the function, that doesn't, that only works for environments where you can actually set headers, like uh, in the Apache module or for CGI. It doesn't actually work on the command line because those headers are just, well, 
because you can't output them anyway, they're just ignored and they disappear. Because unit tests, of course, often run on the command line. Um, yeah, this was useless. So I ordered this to XD because it intercepts all the headers being set. And it doesn't only intercept the headers you set with things like header, but it will also intercept implicitly set headers, like the ones that show with set cookie or by session start. So if I would run this little script, you get something like this back. Uh, session start will set an expires header, a cache control header, and a pragma header. Um, set cookie will set set cookie will set a set cookie header, which makes sense, of course. And yeah, this is quite useful figuring out whether your headers are actually properly set. It makes unit testing quite a bit easier. I know there's, an, there, there's a bug here somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. But there's a bug report for that that makes it stop working if you call get headers once. So I don't know what I have to find it. Out. Okay, the next thing I want to show tracing. Um, this is traces from Boris bikes, or the Barclays Cycler Hire bikes, as they are called officially. A tracing X debug allows you to do is trace every function call that you get. Every function call that you get is dumped to a file. And you can do this in different formats. Now, let me see. So this, first of all, is called a function. I call it both function trace and execution trace. I don't know why. Uh, it's the same thing. Well, a function trace does. It, it dumps every function call to a file. And it is better to see in real life than to have a screenshot of. The screenshot is just there as a backup. So let me open a trace that I made earlier, mm, this one. And then we, we will wait until VI has uh, used all the syntax highlighting on it. It'll take some time. So make the font a bit larger for you guys. This is readable in the back as well still? Too large? I could do it a little bit. Still works? Still works? No? Okay. okay, there we go. <laughs> is this good enough? It's always better to have a little bit more. And, yeah. Okay, so as you can see, I made this trace, er, well, mid last year somewhere. It doesn't matter too much. So what this function trace is, it has recorded for every function call, every function return, and every variable assignment exactly what's happening and when. Um, so you can see that the, script, well, the trace started somewhere in May. Um, the, f the main function was called third, how much is that? One to three milliseconds into the script, because parsing the first script takes some time too. Uh, the nesting level here with the error, uh, arrow, I mean, shows you um, which function calls which function. Uh, the file name, as you can see here, scroll to the end, and the line number. Uh, it also shows uh, arguments to functions, like you see in explode, like here. You see the return value in green here below. Explode obviously returns an array where every element is a part of it. Uh, everything in yellow, or starting with yellow, is a variable assignment. So from this, you can pretty much figure out many things that happen in your script without having uh, to have to do live debugging on it which is something I'll be focusing on. So their name returns this, and the assignment of their name is set to their. And it does not only that for uh, normal variables, but also if you go further down somewhere, where was that? Should have said a bookmark. Somewhere here, it will also do that for, uh, as you can see here, for uh, properties of classes. Oh, wrong button. And adding things to an array, it shows that as well. It provides a lot of information. And uh, this is, I think this is a run of generating my static HTML for my website. And you can see it is quite a lot of data. This scrolls for, well, I'm only at 5% now. So you can imagine that those files are really, really large. It has, this one has 623,000 lines. So I have to say that if you turn this function tracing on by default, you will not get all the information that you're seeing, because you have to turn on the variables, assignment tracing yourself, and also the parameters to functions you have to set up yourself as well. Otherwise, it's simply too much data um, to show. And you need to make sure that if you turn on auto tracing Xebra, that you turn it off, otherwise your hard drive is full very, very fast. And I only say that out of experience. 
and I'll show you how big this file was. This was, uh, I think, 40 megabytes or so? <coughs> 40 megabytes, 39 something. So be careful with that. So there's a few settings here that you can use. Going back to the slide, uh, there's auto underscore trace equals one. If you set this, every script that PHP encounters will then be traced to file. Can be very useful. Sometimes uh, that, what I had happened once is that I was uh, looking at a script and I knew there was only one request, but it still sh created two requests, two files, and I was wondering why. Found out that I had an empty image tag somewhere. And because then, what the browser does, it re requests something empty in your domain, which in my case was the initial PHP script again, so I got two traces. And I was like, ah. That's quite useful to know because you don't want to run that request, right? Um, you can f tell it into which uh, directory to put it, and you can also configure the file name of the uh, trace files. You can include the host, uh, the URL, a time index in microseconds. You can just tell the current working directory, the host name, there's a few things in there that you can set as well. Now, how, however, those traces are quite nice, but it is a bit difficult to parse with a tool. Now, in order to make that simpler, I created a second format, which is an automatic readable format, while well, the other one is automatically readable too, but it's just a fancy name for it. And what this does is instead of using indentation, it uses specific values in the font. I'll be showing that live as well, so function, mm, that one. And then it loads and we have to wait for VI uses syntax highlighting again. As you can see this file is a bit large, uh, it's a bit smaller, it's only 25 megabytes. And I think it's of the same trace. A bit more information here, the first number is the nesting level, the second one is the function number, it counts functions, so you can match start of a function, which you can zero here, and the exit of a function at one. If you match that up with the numbers, you know exactly the time you went into the function and when you went out of the function and the amount of memory being in use when you call a function when you exited the function. And with that, you can do quite a bit of uh, interesting things. You can actually find out, actually, um, which function takes a lot of time. Of course, you need to write a script for that. Well, luckily for you, I have written such a script. Um, let me open this one. I think I changed that to normal. That's why I'm checking this. Again, new laptop. So if I run analyze on this file, then, no, no, that one. That one. Then we wait because it has to parse. And uh, of course, it just doesn't fit. Um, should fit. Give me seconds. If I scroll this far enough, it should. I did test that one. I'll run it once more. There. Okay, so what the script does, it is sorted in this case by t time own. That's the default. Time own means the amount of memory is used in this function, which in this case, interestingly, is array pop. Exactly why this function took a lot of time is difficult to see here, but if you have a user.find function such as um, tokenized string, which shows up quite far up uh, in a list, which takes, including function being called from this function, it takes 0 0.4 seconds. And this function itself takes 0 0.1 seconds. This informa information gives you a bit of an overview to see which parts of your application are slow. It's a very quick way of analyzing it. It also shows you the memory being used. So we have, if we, I think we can sort it like this. If we use um, own memory. Ah, short key, did I do it wrong? Oh, memory own, there we go. All those things I can't remember. It has to parse again. And then it will sort it according to which function takes, uh, well, shows you which function has the largest difference aggregated between function entry and function exit. And 
should be quite a bit, not so much of a surprise that load file uh, shows up on the top because that is the wraparound PHP's include in this case. And of course, every include adds memory uh, because a script needs to be passed, right? One thing that I absolutely don't understand is why the function stat, which really only returns one array, um, being called 433 times, increases the memory usage by about three megabytes. That is something you might want to look at why that happened. I haven't, but because it's fast enough altogether. So anyway, a little script. It, the, the script is part of the XDBug distribution. I don't think you are getting it if you use Peckle for installing it, but you can always just get it from uh, uh, SVN. Right, there is a few more things here. There's HTML traces, which are also awesome, which is basically the same thing, but then in HTML. So if I run trace, no, which one was it? Function trace HTML shows up. And it is the same thing, but then in HTML. The reason why all of this, I didn't want to, but XDBook 1 had this. People were complaining about it that XDBook 2 didn't. It's so, so a very simple way of just dumping everything in the file, and it's very simple HTML. You can see the browser struggling with this because this is a quite large table. <coughs> the browser really doesn't like me doing this. As you can see, this is a... <coughs> Understand why I don't have this, but didn't all this in the first place? Because it's quite useless. Anyway, um, nice non brex space. I will be shutting this down because it takes up too much memory and I have eight gigs in here. Um, Right, you can also use some functions to start and stop the tracing in every format as well. So the next oh, demo I've done. So the next part, squatting bugs. Swatting bugs. I don't know. This is not a real bug, because usually, hopefully in England, they are not that big. Uh, okay, swatting bugs. Uh, XDBug employs a s client server architecture for this, and the protocol between them is called DBGP. DBG is the common debugging protocol. Um, it's not only there for PHP, it's also been implemented for other languages, for, for Python, for Perl, for Tickle, for XSLT. And there's one more that I forgot, keep forgetting, actually. Is this, the part that XDebug implements is, covers most of the specification. There's a few languages that have a few other things in there, too. XDebug is written uh, mostly by me, Employ, uh, implementing the DBGP protocol on the server side because XDebug runs on the server but is actually client considering the protocol. I'll get back to that in a second. And the other languages have been implemented by Active State, which have the Komodo editor. But the same protocol is used for other languages, which meant they only had to write one debug interface, which is pretty good. Now, so there's a few clients for this. There's Eclipse PDT, which is Java based on free. Oh, a few, few hands. Uh, who's using Eclipse here? Or the Zen Studio version of it? No, there cannot be less hands than the first question. <laughs> who's using an Eclipse based ID? Let me put it like that. Okay, that's quite a lot of people. How many of you are actually using Komodo? Oh, there's more hands than normally. <laughs> Five. Uh, <laughs> And NetBeans, that's all. Oh, that's quite a lot more. And PHP Storm, well, also quite a few. So when I was m m writing my slides and, and trying to make some demos, I tried to get Eclipse to work with debugging. I'm just not smart enough for that. So I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> Komodo works out of the box. You install it, it works instantly. You have, don't have to do anything, except for turning it on, which is really quite good. Then I started struggling with NetBeans and PHP Storm. And, um, because I don't use those IDs myself, I don't know my way around it, and find it really annoying that I actually have to make projects for everything. I, that's not how I work. I don't want to spend like hours setting up a project and putting everything in the correct way. I, I've complained to both uh, PHP Storm people and NetBeans quite a bit about that, getting, trying to see if they could make it better. It is getting better, but still not quite as easy as Komodo. I uh, also started writing ages ago a my own client called GTK, GTK I can't pronounce the name. Probably should come up with a different name. GTK DBGP. Uh, try to say that. It's like XKCD, but then even worse. <laughs> uh, 
um, which sort of works and is really quite fast to start, um, but it's not done yet. Uh, it was my little experiment. So I, I'm really quite bad at developing GUI applications because I have no, no, um, uh, I have no notion of aesthetics like you could see with my pink uh, trace earlier. However, um, for the people that you see, okay, so I will. I have installed uh, Komodo and NetBeans. For people that are using NetBeans, who has never seen debugging? Okay, two. Well, I will be demoing it, so you're in luck now. Uh, uh, but first, a, a, a few words on how to turn this actually on, on the xDebug side. It is actually really simple. In the most basic case, the only thing you have to do is set remote underscore, <coughs> <coughs> remote underscore enable, set that to one. That is all you need on the XDebug site. Now, if you have a slightly more complicated setup, like um, you already have something running on port 9000, which does happen sadly, there is VPN software that also uses port 9000, you have to change it. What you can also do is have PHP and an XDebug running on a it's still talking to your IDE running on your workstation. And in order to do that, you have to set remote host to the IP address of the machine where your IDE is running on. The reason why, PHP need, uh, no, why XDebug needs to know that is because the IDE does not connect to XDebug. It is XDebug connecting to the IDE. So your IDE needs to listen on this port, on this port 9000 by default. Now, if you have a firewall in between, you need to do something with that too. Question is if there's any good reason why that can be bidirectional. Um, yes, the reason is because the ID does not know when PHP starts. It simply doesn't know when it starts. Um, you can press run in your ID and then it can try to start, but does that mean that XDebug needs to wait for the ID to connect to it first? Which is which pretty rubbish as a user experience. So. It's easier, a lot easier if XDebug connects to the ID. Now, if you would have your uh, development service in a different network and there's firewall rules in between, it is still possible to use this by installing a little proxy on the firewall, if you can do that. It is a DBGP proxy. Um, the documentation of XDebug explains you how that works. It is uh, something also written by the guys from, uh, from Active State, but it, we can just download it and it's free. I, I probably have a link to it straight from the website. What that allows you to do is an ID then connects to the proxy and tells you, I'm this client with this IDE key. An IDE key is something that is used specifically for this. And an IDE key you can just pick as long as you pick a unique one. The ID will then connect to the proxy so that the proxy knows this ID key belongs to this ID with this, on this uh, IP address. Then when XDebug, you connect not to the IDE directly, but you connect it to the proxy. And in that same request, the IDE keys is used again, so the proxy knows how to proxy to the correct IDE. But this is quite a complicated setup, and only really necessary if, if you have a firewall in between that is really quite um, difficult. In XDebug 2.1, there's a new setting called Remote Connect Back. What that does is, is it bypasses uh, the remote host option, and what it will do is it will try to figure out from the stock, well, if you make a connection to XDebug, XDebug can see where that connection is coming from. And it will use that um, connection, no, I'm saying this wrong, sorry. If you make a web request to PHP, PHP will know the IP address where the request came from. And then XDebug can use that information to connect back to the same IP address. So you don't have to set up the difficult proxy thing. Which is quite useful. Yes. All right. On the command line, it's also quite simple to use xdebug instead of, um, you don't have to do much, many things. The only thing you have to do is, well, you have to set xdebug config and you have to do, use id equal equals something unique. This is basically a hint for XDebug that I need to try to connect to an IDE. So if you make the setting, XDebug will see that and says, oh, I need to connect to this IDE. 
most of the other settings in Xdebug, you can also set with this uh, environment variable. You can set remote host, for example, or remote port and all of those things can also be set with this environment variable, which is quite useful for some IDs that have a in ID function set debug the script on the command line and then it can set the environment variables for you. In a browser, you also need to tell Xdebug actually that you want debugging and you do that in one, well, sort of one way. You can set a, um, a specific HTTP get variable it can also be a post variable or a cookie. And um, as soon as xdebug session start is present, xdebug will then start debugging until at some request, doesn't have to be the request afterwards, you have xdebug session stop. This is something that NetSpeed uses. It uses this way of doing it. If you do debug in the ID, it will use URLs like this. I can show that in a bit. I actually will show you that in a bit. Now, another way of doing it is, is by using a browser extension. There's an extension for Firefox, there's one for Chrome, and there's one for Opera. The one for Opera I haven't listed yet. Each of those extensions, they do basically exactly the same. What they'll do is they go into your status bar of your browser, as you can see here if I scroll it up. Of course, it makes it difficult to go all the way to the bottom now. There, there's this little icon here. Oh, that's really difficult for you guys to see, I realize that. Give me a second. There's a little icon here, that's Firebug. And then there is um, Start Xdebug Session. What, is ex what all of those three extensions do, what it will do is they set a cookie, and Xdebug sees this cookie is set, and then we'll use the debugging for that. And that is a lot easier to start your debugging session. However, NetBeans can deal with this. Uh, I think Eclipse can now. Uh, I haven't gotten it to work with JetBrains either, because I didn't have enough time to set up all the products. With Komodo, you just have to do this and it works instantly out of the box. All right. So this is how NetBeans looks like. This is just a screenshot as a backup, but it will be much better if I can actually show you that. So let's start NetBeans. Now I'm not sure if I've already done that, so let me check quickly. No, that's something else. There's nothing bad. Also, I found out that if you want to debug this kind of things, make sure you only have one IDE running, otherwise you get confused whether it doesn't connect to the correct one. So let me stop this. Let me start NetBeans. This is why I don't use IDEs, it takes much time to start them. It's now Oracle as well, it used to be Sun. It's done, right? So what I've loaded in there, I've created a uh, project that is my website, my personal website. Ooh. Come on, why doesn't that work? <sighs> there. Um, so that's basically it. I've loaded it, it's there, and um, well now would be really cool if I could just go to the browser, set the icon, and it should pop up. NetBeans doesn't do that, so I have to go to run, run my project, and run that. It pops up in the browser, which is my website. And for some reason, that did not start the debugging session because that would be way too easy, of course. I did the try this. Why doesn't it work now? Hang on. Um, let me, oh. Always those live demos, they always go fine while testing, but never. Oh, why didn't that work? The only thing I can think of is that the port is already in use. Let me try once more. Yeah, there we go. Why it works the second time and not the first time, I cannot explain. Anyway, what you can see it did, it added this, um, this get parameter, right? Xdebug session starters, NetBeans dash Xdebug. You can configure the name of it, but uh, for some odd reason, it only works if, it, if you use this IDE key. There's no reason why. They're just being weird about this. Uh, just one would have done. And then, of course, it pops up in the IDE on this screen. So it's it stops at the third line of my script, and then I can uh, hop over it by using those buttons here. Just step over, step into, step out, so I'm going to step over. You can see here in this line I'm setting a uh, URL uh, parameter, Doppler, some other stuff. So I can then, in this variables pane, I can get to see all my variables. 
So I have the super globals in here in an array. It's my API object that is where I store all my stuff. My website is not the best piece of code ever, but it works. Um, so you can expand, you can see all the content in there. Um, arrays, objects, you can expand that. You can actually modify them as well if you want to do that. Mm. Uh, I can't quite recommend changing it, but it does work. You can also see the call stack, which is not very interesting now because there's only one level, but let me go slightly further. Go in there. Blah, blah, blah. Not sure why I didn't use the switch statement there. Okay. Just come on, get to the end. Oh, okay. We're going somewhere slightly deeper. So you can now see in the call stack that there's two levels as well. So you have here the one in the in the latest latest point, and here the one that the function was called from. And if they would have been nice, you could have the call stack um, field in the same place as variable, so you can see them both at the same time. But no, you now have to double click, and then it opens up here. And if you want to see the other one, I have to go back, double click, and they will just open here. So you can see the variables of previous stack frames as well, which are really quite useful. Obviously, you can set breakpoints in here too. So let's set a breakpoint here. I think we can do it by clicking. So if we then press run, it should stop there. And it stopped, yay. Um, <laughs> one thing that it cannot do at the moment is show you the contents of um, internal classes. It doesn't handle that very well. Uh, so S will be created here. You can see it showing up. Oh, it actually does do that. Hmm. It, it does it for some internal PHP classes. I think it does it for PDO, but n not for any of the DOM stuff in PHP, which, w which is where it would be really useful. The reason for that is P those P internal PHP classes, they don't have real properties. They only have pseudo properties that are used when you access them. But it would be really good if Xzebra could actually do the same thing. At the moment, it doesn't do that, but that's something I definitely like to add to that. For any user-defined class, it's fine, of course. Okay, right debugging. This one terminated, yes. For Komodo, uh, what I can do is just start it, wait, yes, whatever. You don't have to open any projects there, but if you go here, I'll remove this part to see whether that also doesn't work now. Oh, actually, that because I probably had enabled it earlier. Yes. So it pops up, and then Komodo says, do you want to debug? We press yes, and we are here in the same place. And it works in basically the same way. Uh, you can set a little bit more different breakpoints because XDBrick supports breakpoints on function entry, function exit, but also on conditions of certain variables being larger than five. Or it will allow you to break every third time um, it hits that line and things like that. It does, does that as well. And not all the IDs have implemented that fully. Uh, not even Komodo, actually. So. That's the debugging part. Let me go back to the presentation. I also have a slide of Okay. There's also something I always keep forgetting. If I'm giving the presentation, which is done in PHP, it also pops up in the IDEs. So I have to turn it off. And we don't want to debugging my presentation. There we go. Uh, there we go, Komodo and the demo that I've just done. This, this does look like useful to you. Yeah. It does it to me. Last thing that I'll be talking about is profiling. Profiling is the art of trying to figure out where things are slow in your applications. And for that, Xdebug has um, functionality in there that writes out profiling files. Profiling files are different from tracing files because they use the same format as uh, cache grind uses. Cache grind is a C-level tool for profiling, similar to what Xdebug implements, uh, but then for C applications. What profiling allows you to do is, with those tra uh, dump files, those profile files, you can run kcashgrind on. kcashgrind is a Linux application, and then you can analyze those files offline. kcashgrind is, is a KDE application. There are pre-compiled binaries for Windows. Um, the URLs for those are on the Xdebug website on the documentation. Um, there's a few more tools as well. So there's kcashgrind for Linux. Uh, instead of showing the slides, I'll give the demo, so don't worry about me skipping over them. So it's Kcache Grind. For Mac, there's a tool called um, Mac Grind, but it isn't free. 
it's like two hundred dollars for some odd reason. Um, there's also f something I forgot to mention. It's a very simple debugging tool for the Mac, which is called Mac. Oh, which of the three acronyms was it? I think it was Mac DB. G DBG, I think it was. But I might have to check. I get lost with all those acronyms. And <laughs> which is a free tool, and it's actually really quite simple and good, and it doesn't require you to install an ID. So that's quite nice. So okay, cash grind, I will show you a little bit of how that looks like. Um, there's more tools as well. There's a tool called WebGrind. And WebGrind is a um, implementation of Kcash Grind, but then as a web script, which is really quite useful too. Uh, I had closed all my previous shells, which wasn't quite smart. Demos. There is profile file. So if I run Kcash Grind with a profile file, you get to see something like this. Um, there's lots and lots of information in here. On the left side, you have the time it took for this function, everything it calls from this function, the, f the amount of time that function used. Sorry, yeah, it's back, sorry. Um, Loudly. <laughs> is that okay? Is it working now again? Yeah? Okay. It's difficult to hear. Um, so My God. <laughs> You need to turn that one on too, I suppose. I'll turn this one off, otherwise we get echoes, maybe. All right. Ah, so now I have a microphone in my hand. Now it would be really used to have three, useful to have three arms. Uh, anyway, uh, what we have here is all the functions that were called. As you can see, I used the same, uh, same script as I used earlier when showing the uh, function tra uh, not the function traces, the, uh, yes, the, fun the computerized function traces that you can read, that I read with the script, right? It is, of course, a different run. You can see things are called 433 times. Let's just click on that and see what happens. You can see who called this function. So main called that, fetch comments called it. Uh, you have the call graph that shows you in an overview. Uh, let's go to main. Which functions took up a lot of time, the amount of time functions were called. So run the RST2 file took up 30% 30 30 almost of the whole request, which makes sense because that's basically the main function of the script. And you can find out um, which parts of your application are slow by just looking at this and following the things to slow parts. There's so much information here that is very difficult to, sh well, I can probably talk to you for an hour about it. I don't have an hour, I only have 10 more minutes, so I'll be continuing. This is basically all I had to show you of Xdebug, with a few words. Xdebug is open source and free, as in free beer, except that it's not alcoholic. Uh, and Xdebug takes up a lot of my spare time. And now living in London, I don't have a lot of spare time anymore. So some people came up with the idea and said, well, we need to help you with this. And there's, uh, they came up with something called um, uh, donations, which I'm always happy about uh, to receive them. It's not mandatory, it just makes me like a oh, warm fuzzy glow inside of me. Um, and for some new features, the idea is that um, to get me to work on that, some of the features in XDBook are really difficult to do because it is a difficult piece of software. Um, this is, uh, by the way, Kcash Grind changed how it worked internally, so the profile files that I'm showing don't work with Kcash Grind anymore. So I have to rewrite parts of this. Um, they came up with this, well, say, how, just come up with an amount, how much would it, this normally cost if this was your normal rate or anything like that. Of course, I put down a little bit less. And see if people are interested in sponsoring specific features. And this is something I'm experimenting with. I don't know if I like it. I would rather work on it for free, but I don't have the time. Which sounds a bit weird, but yeah, you know what I mean. So if you're interested in something like this, let me know and uh, we can talk about this or if you want something specific. Last few words before we go for the questions. 
Uh, Xebic has an excellent website. It has documentation. It has documented everything except the thing that I just discovered yesterday. Uh, the specification is online as well. If you have your own ID of your own tools, you can actually use the protocol specification to write your own tools. It's an open specification. You can do whatever you want with it as long as you implement it and not, not implement it. If you think this talk was useful, uh, please rate it at joinedin at join.in 2522. Um, and the slides of this presentation will be on later at derekwetlands.nl slash talks.html. Now, some questions, if there are any? No questions. Oh, there's, go ahead. <laughs> I'll just, oh, there's one more mic. There we go, that's easy. Uh, I think it was in the um, example uh, of the tracing and um, yes. array pop was the function that was yes. taking the most time. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that the memory for that was a negative number. So I just wondered what that meant. Okay, what array pop is does, it removes elements from an array, even though it returns something that might actually cause a decrease in memory. A PHP's memory manager is a bit old at times. So doing profile management, and uh, no, memory profiling can be really difficult to do because, yeah, the PHP engine itself is just really well, weird about it at times. So it's, it's very difficult to interpret those numbers correctly without understanding exactly how PHP does things. And yeah, I can show that in the tool. That's easily, so. Yeah, there's a few weird things in there with, with memory usage at least. Okay, there are more questions I saw. All the way in the back, you have to run for your job today. Yeah, hello. Um, Hi. For those of us using the Zend framework, there's something um, called Zend Debug, mm. which is basically just a wrapper for var dump. So presumably, once Xdebug is installed, it just simply works. Would that be a correct assumption? Xdebug will work, yes. Okay. If you install it, it works. There is one thing. If you have a user-defined error handler, it will override Xdebug's error handler at times. Okay. And that might be something you need to, have, need to have a look at. But other than that, it's just installing the extension. Um, I have binaries for Windows, and on a Unix operating system, you can compile it yourself quite easily. Okay, the, the other thing, question I was going to ask was, oh, yes. I, I have actually done this and it, it works fine with Zen Framework, okay. any problem at all. So presumably, rather than integrate it into the IDE, you can simply have a PHP ini file, keep changing the settings and just use the browser and it just works. Mm, don't understand the question, I'm oh, sorry. Well, at the moment, it, it just simply, whenever an error occurs, mm. the, uh, X, the Zen, we've got Zen debug on, mm. It is then a wrapper for var dump, which then actually displays things using H X debug. Yeah, that just okay. works. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know they had implemented that. So yeah, yeah. It, okay, cool. And so if you have the PHP ini file, you keep changing the X debug settings, and everything will just appear in the browser. It should just work perfectly. That, yes. In some cases, you might have to restart the browser, or not the browser, the the ser web server, because the web server only will pick up new settings. Oh yeah, yeah, they're yeah, being yeah. made, but yeah. Other yeah, than yeah. that, that you have work. to. You can put them in H access file. Most of the settings you can put in H access file, and then you don't even have to restart a web web server. In oh, that's case. a good tip. Thanks yeah. for that. Okay, there's one more question here. Okay, I have, I have five more minutes, so that's fine. Uh, so I've also got the misfortune of using Zen Framework. i um, been trying to do some profiling on it, but the problem is, is my code is compared to the Zen framework, just doesn't appear on the, in the profiling scripts because it's so much lighter. So is there a way of profiling just my section without having to profile the whole of the Zen framework while I do so? Mm. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> okay, yes and no. You can do it with the profiling functionality because it really has to start when the script starts. And this is something that I'd like to fix, but I haven't had the time for yet. Um, the execution traces, you can do for just sections by just starting it and stopping it when you want to. So the, the thing, however, is because your own code is integrated in the Zen framework so much that it's really difficult to figure out where your code starts and their code stops. But what would be awesome is, would, is if you would be able to filter out everything that starts with uh, Zend underscore, for example. But 
I haven't done that yet, but yeah, that would be something cool to have. I agree. File a feature request. I don't think it's in there yet. If you go to bugs.xdebug.org, you can file feature requests. All right. Anything else? Nope. Oh, oh yeah. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering. Uh, I've only used XDebug a little bit, but I was wondering what's the largest um, profile file you've you've really used and been able to work with? Because I've come up with some rather large ones I couldn't. Mm. I found that Kcashgrind handles it really quite well. The largest files I've seen is in the order of 700 megabytes or something like that, which is a lot of data. But yeah, that worked fine. Okay, so. yeah, I managed a couple of gig with one one file. Um, it took Maybe a few you should hours change your code a little bit or so. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was the aim. So. Okay, yeah, I, I haven't tried anything that large, but so I, I don't know how well that works. But, uh, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? There's one more in front uh, and one in the back. Uh, oops. Go yeah. ahead. Um, I was just going to ask, for like really large projects like Drupal, which have a really large bootstrap, is there any way to easily jump into the modules that you've written to debug them in an IDE? Um, you can set a breakpoint when your code starts. Is there any other way or is that literally you have to define it when you want it for each specific module or file? Yes. <laughs> yes, basically yes. You need to figure out where your code starts. Well, oh, one, also, one thing that I forgot to mention is that there's a function called xdebug underscore break. If you put it in your code, it will break as well. So it can be really useful in those cases when you know about things. Right. Anything else? One more minute. Are you able to... Oh, hi. Are you able to... Um, do profiling in sections and then combine it like XHProf? Uh, the, there's functionality in XDebug that, that actually allows you to profile multiple requests, but that is exactly the function that I've never used myself, so I don't know how it works yet. Mm. And it is not documented, so that will require some effort for me to figure out how it actually works. And But yeah, there are functionalities there. However, XHProf is much better at profiling in a production environment because it's uh, it's it's quite lightweight, and you can do just little small things here, yeah. whereas uh, XDebug does not do that at the moment. All right, I think we have to um, end this because time is up. I hope you enjoyed it. Please rate my talk and enjoy your lunch. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>